I'm your host, Tyler Martin. Wait a second. I'm not Tyler Martin Olich. <laughs> no, you're not. Who are you? <laughs> I'm Jesse Brock. And with me is Hillary Weber. Hi. And we are your co hosts today. Are you excited? I am so excited. I am really grateful that we have the opportunity to speak with Becky Yata today. Becky Yata, Who is yeah. Becky Yata? Becky's a dear friend of ours. Um, she's known the Film Commission now for probably 10 years. Um, she's been making local independent movies with her production company, Be Stellar. Um, and we will learn how she got her start in Tampa through the project The Punisher. You may have heard of it. <laughs> I have, yeah. I'm not necessarily a big Punisher fan, but um, I but think... But that's a big project to get your start on, yeah. 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 And even if, if you don't like the movie. Yeah. So I don't even know if she likes the movie. <laughs> hey, that's okay. You don't have to like everything that you've worked on. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm excited to, to speak with her, learn about her background, learn about her perspective as yeah. a filmmaker, a director. She wears a lot of hats. She does wear a lot of hats. And it's really interesting talking with her and discovering how she balances them all. And um, we also kind of dive real deep into the importance of networking and empowerment. And you're really going to want to tune in for that. So when we get back, Becky Yata. Welcome back to Loose Framing Podcast. We're here with my friend, Becky Yata, director, filmmaker, so many hats. <laughs> how are you doing today? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm really good. Um, so how Tyler normally starts these conversations is with what he likes to call the Reader's Digest question, um, which is how you got your start. But I'm going to dig a little deeper than that. I'm going to ask you what your influences are uh, for filmmaking and what inspired you to even want to become a filmmaker. Yeah, what inspired me was films like Star Wars and um, uh, Spielberg's films like um, E.T. and Jaws and things like that. So I was really excited about that type of filmmaking. And um, when I first decided I wanted to be a director, I kind of looked around and said, well, are, you know, are there women that do this? And I saw that really there weren't that many women. Um, one of them was Catherine Bigelow, who made that great movie Point Break at the, t at the time. That was kind of her big thing, um, which was an action, you know, male sort of oriented movie. And I was like, okay, good. Women can do this. And then the next person I looked at was um, actually a producer and her name was Gail Ann Hurd, which I was very, very lucky to be able to ev ev eventually get to work with. Um, she was kind of my hero. So um, what influenced me was I wanted to do um, something artistic and creative. And the thing about film is it's just so deep. There's so much to learn. There's so much to um, perfect. And um, I just really dig that. For those um, that are listening who don't know who Gail Ann Hurd is, what are some of the things that she's best known for? Well, she was the, um, she's from the Roger Corman School of um filmmaking. You know, he, Roger Corman was a B filmmaker who who basically kept, he kept making films. He had so many films going that he had a whole cadre of people that worked with him on a regular basis. And Gail Ann Hurd was one of those people. She was a Stanford graduate, so that's kind of important. Um, and then she just worked really hard with him to learn all the aspects of filmmaking because she wanted to be a producer. He he also gave her a chance to actually be a producer, which mm -hmm. I don't think would really happen in today's world. He kept her his promise to her. So she and um, James Cameron were contemporaries working with Roger Corman, and oh, they came incredible. up with the idea of the Terminator. And so she was the producer and a co-writer on the original Terminator and all the Terminator series, as well as then Aliens, which was a big thing, and all of the Alien series, and plus a bunch of other movies that are great, like Eon Flux was one of hers. This, she was talking about Eon Flux while we were on The Punisher, which was kind of mm. cool. Um, so she was kind of my hero because she was making, she was a woman who was making the kinds of films that I really liked. So I thought, well, somebody can can do this. So I started working on independent film here in Tampa, and it just took a long time to, you know, 
develop my skills. Yeah. And can you kind of see her influence in those movies? I know we were talking a little bit beforehand, before we were on camera, about how there's you can see kind of some feminism in the in the structure of of the movie Terminator. Mm -hmm. What are some of your favorite moments in that movie that maybe stood out to you? Well, what I admire about her is also something similar to Spielberg, who is another um, influence of mine, which is the ability to make a lot out of very little. Mm. So, you know, to take um, like that final scene in The Terminator where they crush the head of the the skeletal um, robot yeah. thing, um, you know, the thing that crushed it was styrofoam. And the smoke was like somebody blowing cigarette smoke on it. <laughs> Oh, that's amazing. so it was like totally, <laughs> you know, like we would do an independent film. You yeah. just take whatever you have and you make something out of it. But to use um, to use, you know, uh, budgets that are really tight and make something amazing out of it is, is that's sort of my inspiration. And that's that's really where, you know, my heart is. is yeah. I want to do fun stuff. I want to do really great stuff. And obviously, filmmaking is not a place that where, you know, it's you spend gobs and gobs of money, even on small projects that we do here in Tampa, you still end up spending thousands of dollars. But you need to get as much out of it as you can. So I kind of dig that. Yeah, there's like a level of innovation, you need to be a successful filmmaker. And like you said, stay in budget, but with uh, practical effects like that, it's just so cool to hear stories like that. Um, so with your resume <laughs> and with your uh, with your long list of productions that you've worked on, you've both done production, but you've also done live TV. Can you kind of talk to us a little bit about some of the projects you've worked on and and how you balance between working in both? Yeah, I, I I the first television thing I did was I was a technical director on a show called The Tampa Natives, which is actually still running. It's on um, TBAE right now with uh, Mario Nunez, and it's a a show that's like um, about um, Tampa history, kind of or nostalgia about Tampa, um, which I really really dig. I'm a big uh, supporter of our city, and I think we should make more content about our city. Oh yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. So, um, so I was really excited to work with him. Um, and being a technical director mm -hmm. is um, on a live television show, which is really unusual because most people that we really don't do live television shows anymore is incredibly nerve wracking. And I basically learned how to do it on television. Wow. So um, that's daunting. <laughs> it was it was daunting, but um, but we did it for three years, and I got much better at it, obviously. And um, enjoyed it a whole a whole bunch, and um, I'm still doing TV now. We're doing um, another show called Boss Marketing Clubhouse, which is airing on TBCN, which is another TV station that I work for. Yeah. Actually, very local. Yeah, yeah very local. Mm -hmm. Yep, we've done spotlights on both TBAE and TBCN, so they're great friends of ours, and we love to just elevate, you know, Tampa community as a whole. So I love hearing that you're working on that stuff. Yeah, they're both great. Both great TV stations. And there's and, some good interviews. I've had a chance to check out a couple of the episodes. And they're really, like, you really dig in deep. But you aren't just looking at somebody's resume. You're also talking a lot about, like, what is the emotional work that you're going to have to do to be a filmmaker, be on a film set? What does that look like? What does perseverance look like? It's just some really interesting things that I don't think are... The, like we don't yeah. always talk about like well what are the emotional parts of filmmaking yeah. and the mental yeah. parts and how do you deal with stress and things like that and the so emotional then, maturity that's required to handle these things and to get it from a to z you know cross that finish line i per um, i personally think that's all of it really i mean because there is a lot to learn in filmmaking and there's a lot of technical details that you have to learn and a lot of people spend all their time learning those technical details but it's really determination to get to get through um, because there's a lot stacked against you um, as a filmmaker. Um, it's an expensive medium. It's not like painting where, you know, you can go to the store and buy $20 worth of paint and make a painting, but uh, filmmaking is going to be a collaborative business that you're going to have to work with a bunch of people and it's going to cost money. I mean, even when we made those boss marketing clubhouses, um, I had a studio that had you know, and I had friends um, donate their camera time and donate their time, but it still cost me a couple thousand dollars just to make, you know, four or five TV shows. Mm -hmm. So, um, well, we kind of touched on Gail Ann Hurd and, and how she was an influence on you. And you mentioned that you got a chance to work with her. What project was that on? Well, do you want to hear the whole story? Oh, I want to hear it all. <laughs> so, on the very first film that I worked on, um, I, 
I was, we were out at this warehouse in um, off of West Shore that's not there anymore. Like now they built these big condos because it's on the water. But there was this old uh, warehouse out there called Westinghouse. And I'm not sure what they built in there, but it was an enormous building, uh, five stories tall, like a football field long. And it had these big pits in it with like water and like rebar sticking out. Everybody was terrified to walk through there in the dark. There was like an osprey that would like come down. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I was the only one that could walk through there in the dark without being scared because I wasn't raised on horror films because even though I do make horror films, I'm not a horror fan really. Mm. So all the other guys were like, this is totally a horror film set up right here. <laughs> but anyway, the uh, it turns out that the locations people for um, The Punisher when it was coming actually came there and looked at the sets that I built. We were all really excited and everybody was like, oh, we're going to get on The Punisher. And um, so we all went down to the office, which was on Harper Island together. And one of the guys was just a real jerk to the secretary and just kind of acting like he was a big shot or something and um, kind of upset her. So I came back another day and I was like, I'm not with him. And, <laughs> you know, please consider me. And so we kind of made friends. And then eventually someone got fired up in the chain. Um, and then that woman who was the secretary got put in that position. And then somebody else who was a, an office production assistant, she became the secretary and now they needed an office production assistant. So they called me because I had some office work on my resume, whereas all the other people were just film people and they didn't have anything in the real world to really um, show that they could do stuff. Which is interesting because, you know, you don't really think about that as, as, you know, film is a business and it yes, and it requires a lot of different business skills, which I think most people who are in film don't realize that. But I got hired as an office production assistant. Um, and so Gail was the reason. I never told anybody that I wanted to be, I wanted to meet her. I never told any of my friends. I never told anybody that that was the reason. But I would just like look at her and be like, oh, I'm never going to meet her. You know, I'm just going to work in the office. So I'm making sides one night. It's like nine o'clock at night. I'm at the copier making these sides. I'm getting thinking about going home because, you know, we still work long hours, like 10, 12 hours, even though we were in the office. Somebody called and said, hey, uh, Gail wants to see you at on set. And I was like, what? And so I went down to the set, which was down here, downtown, right where the um, the beer can building is, Okay, right on the street on Ashley. So the little, she had her little, you know, uh, director's chairs along with the line producer and somebody else. And they wanted to meet me because she had fired her assistant and somebody suggested that I would be a good replacement. So then I had to go and talk to like the production coordinator to make sure it was okay. And of course, the production coordinator was kind of mad that they were taking me away, but they were also like, well, the producer gets whatever she wants. Yeah. So I got to be the assistant to Gail Ann Hart. So I was oh, just amazing. beyond. Yes. But um, it was it was interesting. I still think about her to this very day. I still think about like her mannerisms and her like the just the just the way that she was. Um, you know, she she was really didn't have a lot to do for the movie itself, but um, she was really busy. She had a bunch of other films. So she has a whole production company in LA that she was keeping in touch with and everything. So I, my job was to like pick up packages. And then my biggest um, thing that I did was the wrap gifts, which was just to, I had to check with every department and make sure that all of the people that were in those departments mm -hmm. were actually there. So, so it was really fun being her assistant because basically anything that I said, people jumped and did whatever I asked. Yeah. Uh, of course, the, you can't the abuse power. that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can't abuse that. No, it wasn't no, no. me that had the power. It was her. And right. Because yeah. I I was... But um, you were on her behalf. So, yes. So, therefore, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but it was also kind of painful because, um, you know... Um, Oh, she's an exacting woman. Let's put it that way. <laughs> I'm sure you have to be to be a female producer at that time and to work yes. on such big movies. You've probably got to be a bit of a, a tough cookie. Yeah, well, I think. Yeah, I think she is. I think she just is a tough cookie or commanding at, yeah. at the least. <laughs> yeah, and um, uh, but she ran a really good ship. It was the only. Um, it's the the big film that I've worked on. Um, and you know, I was really impressed with um how how organized everything was the food was amazing i know that seems like a kind of a minor thing but on a film it's no, everything yeah. yeah catering on a film set will sometimes make or break how your crew is you know 
treated and feeling and you know kind of makes or breaks project sometimes so i agree with that it showed me what professionalism in film really is you take care of the people that work with you um everyone is uh, who has a job is required to do their job but but that you get they need to be cared for properly so you don't overwork people you know so they kept to the hours and and all of the things, all the things that you're supposed to do on a professional film set. So I'm, I guess I'm a little spoiled in that way. Yeah, so. but what a start to your career. I mean, that's amazing. Um, kind well, of transitioning from her production company to your own. Can you sort of explain to us what Be Stellar Production is and how it kind of was founded? Yeah, um, I um, I'd worked on a bunch of independent films, um, and you know, just tried to find try my try to find my footing in filmmaking in this town which is you know there's really not that much here so it's it's it was kind of difficult so eventually i decided that i was just going to start my own production company and just start making stuff on my own so um i had a a business partner that helped me and we just we started an llc and just started um doing stuff so the first thing we did was a project that was really close to my heart that really wasn't financially, it didn't really make any sense financially at the time. And my business partner was like, he called it a pro bono, my pro bono (laughs) thing, which was, um, I met somebody who um, was the director of a small after school care program for girls called the Center for Girls. And I wanted to to show, we're gonna do like a video production class, but we, what what we ended up doing was teaching the girls how to make film because hmm. I wanted to see little girls in that age group making film because people like Spielberg started when they were like 10 and 12 years old and lots of guys do start thinking about their own careers at that age where girls tend to not do that. They tend to not even think about a career until they're well into their 20s even, but um, not to, girls tend to be kind of shunned from film maybe because things are black and masculine looking or something they're just not drawn to it but i knew that little girls could make film and i so that was what we that's what we did so um we got them we i mean i didn't really teach them anything i just sort of corralled them and gave them instruction general instructions like you know but really they made these amazing little short films and then we turned it into a documentary mm. and then we we actually did like a whole red carpet event at this, um, uh, there was like a, it was a, a monthly thing. It was like, it was called a film festival, but for short films, but it was like a monthly one. And I kind of took it over one month to do this red carpet event for the girls. Cause I wanted them to see what it's like to be on the other side of the camera yeah. and to be the one making, instead of being seen, to be the one making the the stuff. Deciding how women are gonna be seen. Exactly. Yes. And at that moment, it just so happened that that was the Me Too movement happened at the same time. Mm, And so did the the conversation about why there weren't women directors. So I got to be on like daytime television talking about it. And the girls came with me, some of the girls did. And um, it was so amazing because while we were on daytime, they had the big jib, you know, camera. You know what I'm talking about? Um, With the wheels and everything. Mm -hmm. They let my girls touch them and use them and there was this young woman that walked by um who was like she said something like they won't even let me touch that (laughs) and i was like well it's kind of funny that these girls like skipped the line yeah they just went right to the top and it proved to me that you know as a woman or as a filmmaker you really just have to take control over your own destiny yeah and you have to do it yourself so you know, especially as a director, no, no one's going to, there's not, they don't put advertisements for directors Mm -hmm. anywhere. You can't find them. So you have to kind of make your own project. And if I wanted to make something of my own, I needed to just do it. So um, that, that documentary was really fun and and, an interesting project to do. That's really endearing. And I'm going to (laughs) cry. I get the sense that through a lot of your work, you are empowering women or empowering um, young people or not just chasing a paycheck. Can you talk about what's that like sometimes? How do you have to decide between doing something creative that maybe you're passionate about um, or doing something just so that you can feed your face? Do you find that that's something that you come up against a lot? I mean, the the entire conversation about film could really be boiled down to money and the, you know, 
you have to, it takes money to make film, even at the smallest level. And, um, and it's, that's really kind of what it's all about. But when we did the center for girls project, I wasn't concerned about that. And it, it really wasn't politically, a, you know, it wasn't like thought out, like this is going to be a smart thing to do or anything because I didn't necessarily want to come out as like a feminist or, or anything like that, but it, it really meant something to me. And I, I just wanted to do it. And, um, and so, uh, but but picking subjects to make film is I'm very thoughtful about who is the audience um, and who is going to buy this mm -hmm. and and then also who who will who will sponsor it or or you know believe in it enough to give us money. Mm -hmm. So um, that's why we've pursued uh, more horror films um, and more um, kind of action. But horror is a great genre for low budget independent filmmaking because you can make a horror film that is incredibly low budget, no actors that are known, and it will still sell pretty much no matter how bad it is. <laughs> because there's a market for American, even terrible horror films, there's a market for it somewhere in the world. So if, um, so that's why, and it's fun, really, really fun to make, I find. Um, so that's why I, I've been more interested in making horror films. I'm not like I said, I'm not really a horror fan. I don't really like the whole getting being scared um, thing. But, but it's different when you're behind the scenes, right? And you're kind of seeing uh, how the sausage is made, and then you're like, "Well, this isn't scary anymore." Oh, <laughs> it is the most fun horror by far. Is the most fun to yeah. make because um, you know you just get to be really inventive and um, you know trying to create those scares is really fun. So, um, so I really enjoy it, but it is a financial, um, decision for sure yeah. because, um, you know, you don't want to spend all of this energy. I don't know if you've ever like looked for films or something to watch and you're like, eh, 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 nah, nah, nah. Like it doesn't jump out at you. And I think to myself, those people spent all of this time and energy making that film. And I don't even care. <laughs> like, I just don't care. I'm like, who is that person? I don't know it's a romance or it's this or that. I'm like, I'm probably not going to like it. So you have to build into your filmmaking something that will grab people from the very beginning. That's why they use celebrities. Celebrities are a great way to get your films made because they have power. Just the name or the the just the familiarity of looking at someone that you remember from anything. It doesn't matter what it is. Any kind of um, person that's a, a slight celebrity, mm -hmm. um, get them on your film. You could literally take it to the bank if you have a, a, a celebrity signed to your filming. So, um, and then pick a genre that, you know, pick a genre and then go all in on that genre that where your, your people, your audience members eventually are going to be excited to watch it. Yeah. Well, it kind of goes back to, and Tyler has had this conversation with me, like the blockbuster wall, you're looking at the cover of, you know, not to judge a book by its cover, but that's what draws people in. And now it's very similar on streaming platforms where, oh, this has, you know, this guy in it from that other movie I saw. I'm going to check this one out, you know, and that's generally how people pick what they're going to watch. So yeah, yeah that, that makes little total thumbnail. sense. That little thumbnail, that's all you get really. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, for marketing purposes, that mm -hmm. makes a ton of sense. To and I love that you've talked a little bit about marketing a film. How do you market and brand yourself? And as Becky et al. And, and Be Stellar Productions, how do you do that? How do you sell the the product that you are creating and offering to people? Well, um, we we um, I mean one of one of the main things is just is just networking, which I, I didn't realize was a form of net, of marketing, but it is. Um, it's kind of one on one uh, marketing. Um, and I've always said that if I could just get in front of people, um, they will they'll buy me because you know I can I can impress I guess. Um, but you know we we did develop a show called Boss Marketing Clubhouse. It was specifically designed to um, attract marketing directors, um, CEOs, p uh, presidents, people who are running small businesses or medium sized businesses, or who are the creative director the people who would hire a video person like myself. Mm. So that way I can get in touch with them and connect with them and um, get to know them a little bit more and they can get to know me. And then maybe when uh, they have a, a need for video, they'll hire me. So that's sort of, that's sort of what we've done. Mm -hmm. um, we haven't done a lot on, on um, social media mainly because I'm just not very good at posting because 
I need to be like, it's like the shoemakers, uh, kids don't have any shoes. It's, it's very much like that. Like I don't really do the marketing for myself that I should, but, um, but I am, uh, working on marketing for TBCN and, um, and sales for TBCN. So I've, I've, um, I've done a lot more work with them, honestly, on on doing that. So we've created a landing page and email funnel um, and gotten real deep into the processes of um, email marketing and that kind of thing. Does so that answer the question? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, and I think there have been a lot of guests on our podcast who have talked about the importance of networking. All right, what are some big networking fails? What are some things that people shouldn't do or things that you've said or done in the past that maybe you're like, oh gosh, that was not the right move or I should have played that differently? Do you have any uh, moments like that? Well, my theory on networking is, um, this is very, very personal to me, which is um, I, I have a tendency to say stupid things. I don't know if you guys ever do that, but- Oh, never. I never, never, never say anything stupid. <laughs> We just film ourselves. <laughs> yeah, and then you're like, oh. <laughs> of course, everybody yeah. does. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, or awkward. I'm, I'm, I guess I heard a person who wrote a book about being awkward. She said that she's a recovering awkward person, which I, I love <laughs> oh, that. I yeah. love that. Yeah. I identify as that. I, I think so too. So, <laughs> I'm not recovering yet, but maybe I can get there after this conversation. <laughs> well, my theory is I, I just stopped blaming myself for doing dumb things and and just and and I refuse to think about it. So if I go to a networking thing and I do something dumb, I just go I just refuse to think about it. I'm like, "No, nah, I'm not going to worry about that. Whatever. Move on to the next thing." Because it's more about the confidence that you have and how and and just your it's really about caring about other people. Like, yeah. you know, if you go to a networking thing and you just concentrate on caring about the people that you're talking to, not don't think about yourself. It's not about you. It's about them. What can you offer them? How can you help them? Try to remember their name. Um, try to remember something about them. They'll love you. That's straight out of How to Win Friends and Influence People. Okay. Dale Carnegie. And it is really simple. Just yeah. be interested in other people and they will think you are interesting. Mm. That's literally a quote. That is a quote from Jane Fonda. And I actually gave my brother dating advice one time. <laughs> and I was like, just make sure that she's equal parts interested and interesting. You know, she has to ask questions about you as much as you're asking questions to her. And, you know, that's a really, I just love that philosophy for life in general too, but especially in networking. I feel like that definitely comes in handy in your, in your toolbox. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Eventually they will ask about you and then you can say something about you. But, but you know, it doesn't even matter. You don't even have to ever talk about yourself. Talk about them, right? Because they'll 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 love that. People like to talk about themselves, and people like when people are interested in what they're saying. So. Yeah, they like to feel heard. You yeah, know? absolutely, and cared about. And if you know, if you do that, then it doesn't matter if you say something stupid or you're a little awkward or whatever. Mm -hmm. And 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 it's practice too. It's practice. So throw yourself in and just keep on doing it. So that's what I did. I just started going to any kind of thing that I thought was interesting in the city, um, any kind of like networking event of, of any kind. I would just go to it and just start talking to people. And, mm -hmm. and you know, I try to look nice. So at least I felt a little comfortable, you know, looking nice. And then just try to, you know, talk to people and be friendly and stuff. That's great advice. I love that. In yeah. filmmaking though, you need to network by working on other people's projects on independent films because you need to find your crew members, mm. possible crew members. So you need to like see what people are like when they're working um, and what they are with each other and like, you know, and how mm -hmm. it all plays out. You're auditioning them kind of before yes. you're even talking or thinking Not about what they're that. saying about themselves, but what they're actually doing on set and how they're making the project happen for other people. Yes. So that way you can get a whole bunch of DPs that you can call on a moment's notice or a lighting person or an audio person. You need to have those people that will work with you and that will, you know, uh, so those are that's how you find them and connect with them. So I did that. I did a lot of um, you know free stuff. I did free stuff for a long, long time. So your question about whether to eat or not is that is the <laughs> that's the main the main problem is that you know as there's no fund for being an artist. Um, you know I guess that's what Patreon is, but um, but people used to have patrons that would support them while they were developing themselves as artists. So you have to find a way, whatever it is, find a way to make, uh, to survive while you're being an artist. Um, and then eventually, we, you know, we hope that it'll pay off, but that's not really why I'm doing it anyway. So, you know, it doesn't really matter if it pays off, I guess. But I, it, 
it, I've gotten to the point where I don't do free work anymore um, because um, I just can't afford it. I need to um, have. Yeah, you get to a point in your career where you're like, okay, I've proven that I can do this. Here's my projects. Pay me. You yeah. know, <laughs> yeah, there is a value on what you're doing yes. and what you're bringing to yeah. the table. Well, yeah. you have to hold your, you have to say that you're valuable. You have to demand that you're valuable and say that this is worth this much mm -hmm. money. And it, a lot of times that means saying no to things. Yeah. Well, saying no is basically advocating for yourself and like, no, I'm worth more than what you're saying I'm worth, you know? Yeah. Absolutely. So, yeah. Um, so back to your project, um, the documentary, um, the, the documentary involving the Center for Girls and the empowerment that you gave them through that project. Um, I definitely, just to give you a little bit of backstory, I was trying to decide majors um, for college in the early 2010s, so before the Me Too movement. Um, and I was trying to decide between journalism and film. And journalism, obviously, was going all digital, but film, I'm a very like results oriented person. So I was like, where can I actually find a job? And one of the real hangups I had majoring in film was the lack of female representation. So um, I feel like if I had a program or or just saw that documentary at that time, it would have completely changed my view on everything. Um, what is your favorite part of the filmmaking process? Is there something that reminds you, oh, wow, this is why I started. I mean, I do all of this other stuff. Like I produce, um, I do marketing, I do sales, I do all of these other things. I'd set design, um, I do the production coordinating, I hire everybody. I do all those things so that I can be a director mm -hmm. and make a film. And um, I, I want to be the one that influences the the final product, you know, and make and make it a story that resonates from some place inside of me. So um, it's so rare that when you're in those moments, and I try to remember, you know, you, I have to enjoy this too, because it's usually like incredible pressure and, you know, exhaustion and stuff. Um, so I try to really enjoy those, those moments. Um, and then after you've done the production part of filmmaking, then you have to get into the editing room, um, which I don't enjoy as much, but um, unless I'm sitting next to the editor and I can just walk away when I'm <laughs> bored. Um, but, um, but yeah, I like, uh, that's what I, I really like to do is, is to, um, to create something that comes from my heart and has, has some resonance from within inside of me, um, and that you can see it on film. So that's really what I love to do, but it's, it's really, really rare. Yeah. Yeah. A phrase that I've heard you use in relation to your direction is it's all in the frame. Can you tell us what that means and what that means to you specifically? Yeah, it, it's all in the frame is a um, is a, a like a catchphrase um, that's, you know, when you're filming, obviously, whatever is seen in that uh, camera frame is all that matters. Like we were talking about the Terminator and the styrofoam and the smoke that no one saw the cigarette smoke person outside of the frame doesn't matter just what's in the frame that's all that matters but you can also use it in in terms of framing your life or your or whatever it's all in the frame so it's it's how you look at something that defines how it's going to affect you mm. or or how you're going to move forward with it it's how you look at it and um, what you decide are the parameters you know of that thing yeah that's kind of goes back to your networking advice like if you frame it that, oh, I messed up, I was so awkward, or you can frame it like, oh, like I was talking about them and I was enthusiastic and it kind of all kind of ties into your philosophy, you yeah. know? It's very yeah. cool. Yeah, it sounds like perspective can matter a lot. Um, you've mentioned stre uh, sets can be stressful sometimes and there can be a lot of unpredictability. Do you have any things that you do or advice for dealing with some of that unpredictability? On, on sets? On, well, yeah, I think as it relates specifically to, to being in film production, is there anything you remind yourself on set or are, they, are there things that you do if things are starting to get heated? Like where do, you, where do you go in your head? What do you tell yourself? What Do you have questions that you ask for figuring out a problem and moving forward? Um, I, don't, I don't really think so. Um, logistics is like um, – Logistics is a main part of production, and that's usually what happens. It's either an emotional problem, like somebody's having a little bit of a drama moment, or it's a logistics problem. It's usually the problems that come up while you're actually on film. So um, those are like I'm just really good at those both of those things. Um, so uh, you know, m 
you know, handling handling people who've who've gone a little off the rails. Uh, mainly, I think you can prevent that by being a good production uh, manager if mm. you schedule things correctly. Um, so that you don't have people working in enormously long hours because that's when people get tired and then the, they become, it's not just irritable, but it becomes dangerous. It can yes. actually be dangerous. So you want to make sure that people have rest and they have food, just like we were talking about. You need to take care of the people that you're working with. Yeah. Um, and if you do that, um, then you, know, you can kind of stave off. And also, I tend not to work with people who I don't know. Mm. That's why the whole networking thing is really important because yeah. I want to know already before going in because once you're in, you can't change anything. Like if you've hired an actor who's a pain and you've already shot something with it, you have to see it through. There's just no choice. You have to see it through. So um, you want to work with people that are going to be friendly and nice and accommodating to yeah, each other. Flexible. Yeah. Flexible, understanding. Um, but um but also can respond in the moment. Like, yeah. I don't know if you've ever been on set where you just like that, there's that one person that just can't figure out what the right thing to do is and they like knock things over or whatever, or they're just in the shot and you're like, why are you there? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yes. You have to be the kind of person that can kind of, you see spatially where you should be. You you know, not don't mess up anything. Don't, uh, don't trip on those wires, stuff like that. So, mm -hmm. um, I don't know if that answers your question or not. Awareness. Yeah, no, it Awareness, does. It does. Yeah. Yeah. I just like you because you do so we do wear so many different hats. I like hearing about how you approach all of these different things and how you bring it all together. Because there are some people we've spoken to, they their job is one thing. They're a location scout, location manager. Yeah. That's all they do. But you have all of these different things that you bring in. So Yeah. yeah. And this I is think, really helpful stuff that you're saying. Yeah. I think for me, um, I tend to um I tend to kind of gather the forces, you know what I mean? And like, um, I, I, that's how I sort of think of it is I'm, I'm gathering the forces of energy to make this film and then protecting those energies to keep bad things from happening while we're doing it. And just, I just drive forward. And if you're in my vicinity, you're going to feel it and you're just, and, and you're going to see it too, because I'm going to give you a dirty look if you did something wrong. <laughs> yeah. And we're all going to move forward to do this thing. And so that's sort of how I, I view it. I think that's the best illustration for a producer that I've ever heard in my life. Yeah, <laughs> like I can I really picture like that. that. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. And it's your job as producer to, to protect this vision to nurture this vision and everybody that's involved in bringing it to life. Yeah. yeah and then because I have this drive of this is what we're going to do, and it's palpable. I think um, everybody sort of gets on board, and they're like, "Oh, I better, I better do right, and I better, you know, get on board with this." And if you're not, you need to leave. You yes. Um, well, before we wrap, I wanted to kind of chat about how we met. We met through a um, personally how you and I met. We met through Women in Film and Television, the Tampa Bay chapter. Um, can you just talk to us about your time there and um, you know what you took away from it and how you got involved? Yeah, um, it was actually that um, that first uh, project that I did when I started Be Stellar Productions, which was the Center for Girls project. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, I knew Rose. Um, I th I think I'd known her from Facebook or something, and uh, I knew she was a casting director. And um, I tracked her down to an art. She was an, she does um, art stuff too, like uh, blow, she blows glass or something. And she and some friends have a had an, an art um, display event. So I tracked her down to that event. And I was like, hey, I'm doing this thing and I need um, actors to come um, and volunteer for my girls to film. And so she was like, oh, this is a great idea. And so she got Melissa McNearney, who was also mm -hmm. involved in women in film. And then they helped me do it. And then they gave me an nice. award, which was how they got me in because <laughs> yeah. I had to like become a <laughs> member to get the award. And so it was really, really nice. They gave me like a, a community award for yeah. doing that project. Well, Women in Film and Television is a nationwide organization, one of the biggest, I think, in in the nation. Um, and Tampa Bay's chapter is includes both Tampa and St. Pete, so it's one of the largest chapters in Florida. Um, but what they do primarily is kind of elevate 
uh, women in film. It's open to men too, but but you know definitely elevating the voice of women in film and television. Um, and they do award uh, grants and scholarships, um, you know, at their annual event every year. So it's a great organization. It is a great organization. I've been I was involved for many years, and I got to be on the board, and eventually ended up being the uh, branch chair for a for a little while. Mm-hmm. And I just I loved working with them. It is a great organization. I actually went when I. I visited LA. I went to a um, women in film event in LA, mm. and it was incredible. I was like, "Wow, these people are amazing!" And the the you know, it, it's just it's always been amazing. So, it's also been the best networking of all the film groups in Tampa. Um, I always thought women in film was the best networking because mm. the people that I met from women in film w- actually gave me jobs or connected me with people that hired me for things. Whereas um, a lot of the the other groups and the other people I met them but I they didn't nothing ever happened no follow through yeah, yeah. nothing happened so yeah. um so women in film is a great organization they have um an excellent um you know holiday parties a lot of fun and everybody goes everyone so you have to go to those <laughs> yeah yeah that's actually coming up in December the jingle mingle yeah so. yeah yeah, and we're glad, uh, you know, the pandemic is finally over so we can get back to doing the fun yep. stuff that we used to do. Networking in person. Yeah. 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 Well, before we uh, wrap it up, is there anything that you want to add? I don't know. Is there anything that you want to tell us? Is there anything that you're working on that you're excited about you want to share? Yeah, I'm 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 working with TBCN now, um, um, doing sales and marketing with them. And I'm really excited about working with them because even though it's, they're, it's kind of um, – They've been around a long time, like 30 years, I want to say. They have a new executive director, and it's like a breath of fresh air. She's mm. just amazing. All the people that work with it are amazing. Tyler is on the board. Yep. <laughs> um, Steve Bueno is on the board. Mm-hmm. We've got uh, DT from um, WMNF um, and Q. Um, has his own production company. He's amazing. Um, we just got amazing board members. The staff there are just some of the most caring and wonderful people that I've ever worked with. I just love working with them. They um, teach people video production in Hillsborough County for free. Mm-hmm. So yeah. it's really an amazing thing. So the energy there is incredible because it just fosters this sort of community um energy from people who are just trying to start out in the film industry and trying to get somewhere. And um, I'm thinking I'm I'm going to be making a film in October. I might have to postpone that one, but but there's a film I'm working on where I get to direct. Um, Somebody wrote it, a a good friend of mine wrote it, and uh, we're looking to, to film it possibly in October. And we're rolling out more Boss Marketing Clubhouses. We're doing that again at um, TBCN now. And um, I'm really excited about that. Uh, we're also doing a pastor's PSA. It's called Lights, Camera, or Lights, Camera, Faith. Okay. We're going to be um, inviting pastors from religious organizations to do a little PSA uh, that we're going to run on our station. And, um, you know, to, to connect with the community. So... Yeah. Um, I'm really excited about working with them and all that stuff. Yeah. Well, that's amazing. We can't say enough great things about TBC and their amazing partners to have in our community. Um, if people listening are like, ooh, Becky Utah, I want to reach out to her. And or hire her. <laughs> or hire her. Or just follow her on social media. How, how do you recommend that people reach out to you? Um, you can um, email me at b.stellarproductions. Um, at gmail.com or um, follow me on Facebook at Becky Yatal. Okay. Um, yeah. Well, very cool. Thank you for joining us today. This is a great conversation. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank um, you for having me. Thanks. And for those of you tuning in, stick around. We'll be right back. Welcome back. That was a great conversation, wasn't it? Yeah, it really was. She is um, probably one of my favorite guests that we've had so far. Yeah, honestly, I uh, I felt like a little kid listening to her. <laughs> I know I mentioned um, that I almost cried, and it's true. Uh, the Center for Girls documentary, I don't know. I felt like 
it was just something that young Jesse really from that exposure could have it could have changed what I majored in. But I mean, I'm very grateful for where I ended up in my career. Obviously, I found the world of public relations, which in my opinion is the marriage of journalism and film. So and I and I feel like I fit that mold very well. But uh, but I do. I love film. And I always wonder, like, you know, what if? And that might have been just, you know, the nudge was that representation and 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 the point that, yes, it, your voice is important. And here it is on the on the big screen. Yeah, I really love that she seems to empower not just women, but young filmmakers, especially young female filmmakers. That is so important to always right. be lifting people up um, when you are a, a female in this industry. Yeah. Well, speaking of that, um, we actually asked our audience um, what their favorite movies were that were directed by women directors. Um, and we have a list here. But first, I wanted to start it with our favorites. So I'll start with you, Hillary. Who are your favorite female directors or or women filmmakers? I think my favorite film directed by a female is one that like nobody ever realizes a woman directed, American Psycho with Christian Bale. You forget, like you, you. It just seems like a very masculine movie, so yes. you forget that Mary Heron worked on that. And then um, another one of my favorite female filmmakers. We mentioned one of her documentaries in an earlier podcast. Um, Jenny Livingston, Paris is Burning. <gasps> Yeah, she's amazing. I got to meet her at Sundance one year. I was processing passes, and she came up and she told me her name, and it like. It took me a second. I'm like, I know this. I know this name. Where have I seen this name? But you know, you're doing like thousands of people a day, so you're yeah, not yeah, yeah. like thinking about. It. So I asked her, I'm like, what? I'm so sorry. Where do I know this from? She's like, Oh, I'm a filmmaker. Like I was a director. You know, Paris is burning, and I like yeah, almost yeah, like her fell out of my chair. Yeah, it was incredible. So oh, as you know, that <laughs> movie touched me. So I'm like, just, and it makes sense that that is a woman filmmaker. Now that you say it, but yeah, that's a very important movie. I think to both of us. Um, what about you? So I'll have to jump on the bandwagon here. I know that Barbie is a huge sensation right now, but I have been a fan of Greta Gerwig since Lady Bird. And I think that that was really her first um, chance to kind of show the world her voice and, and, and amplify it. I think a lot of people were watching that movie and I just, I love it. I love the style of it. And then fast forward to Little Women, that was my first exposure to Florence Pugh, mm. who is one of my favorite actresses ever. But her and Saoirse Ronan in that movie, their chemistry together and their dynamic um, with Timothée Chalamet. I'm not the biggest fan of Timothée Chalamet, but I think he fits in that role. Um, but yeah, I just, I really like her work. And then another important one for me, which was while I was in school, I was while I was doing all of my research, figuring out how many women are actually working in film directing and in creative roles, Catherine Bigelow. Mm -hmm. I know Becky had mentioned um, that that was also one of her big influences with Point Break and Hurt Locker and all of these, like you said, um, you know, like these action movies, like you said about American Psycho, like a very you kind of assume it's kind of a man's perspective. But you can once you know, you can kind of see where you're like, oh, OK, Keanu. Reeves <laughs> like you know <laughs> obviously um that had you know a female touch to it in Point Break and Bodhisattva and like it's just a great story um but my personal favorite is Domi Shi in a movie called Turning Red and mm. it is animated and it is a Pixar film she originally got her start in Pixar as an intern and then she made the short film Bao which okay, I think yeah. is one of the most successful um, short films in recent history with Pixar. Um, but it's a lot of Chinese representation, Asian representation, and it's adorable. And and the lighting and the and the animation is just like untouchable. She's so talented. So she made this movie called Turning Red, and it is all girl. And it's I mean, it's definitely a perspective of she was in elementary school or middle school at the time that boy bands were popular, like 2000. So it definitely resonates with me very, very deeply. But there's also a lot of family ties to it. And again, um, a lot of Chinese representation in that as well. And gorgeous art. So, but do you want to read? Um, do you want me to kick it to you for the audience? 
um, people? Sure. So we asked our audience some of their favorite movies by female directors. Um, and so we ended up with American Honey by Andrea Arnold, uh, Lost in Translation and oh, Marie yeah. Antoinette by Sofia Duh. Coppola. Sofia Coppola. That's another really big one that I feel like, yeah, a lot See, of people. I actually, I don't like Marie Antoinette. I don't know if I can say that, but I, <laughs> it's, I've, it's one of the few movies I have almost like walked out of. What was of the in other one? Not lo it's Lost in Translation. She did the uh, Virgin Suicides. That one was a little not my speed, but I mean, you know. Also, she's a Nepo baby. <laughs> Uh, I mean, I didn't do enough research to real to you know, but she's the only one I see on that list. So, <laughs> anyways, uh, moving on. <laughs> then we also had um, Selma from Ava DuVernay. Yeah, she's another female filmmaker who's all about like empowering female artists. Yes. Um, oh, Amy Heckerling, Clueless, and Fast Times at Ridgemont High. You like those, don't you? Fast Times at Ridgemont. Well, Clueless, I love. I love Clueless. I watched that movie way too many times <laughs> as a kid. Um, but Fast Times at Ridgemont High, I had no idea. Did you know that? I didn't realize that that was also Amy Heckerling, but it makes sense when, like, when you find that out. Like, right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, but one thing I will say before we before we wrap up the show um, is in preparation for this, um, I always try to like do my research and stuff. And I was looking at the recent list of female directors working now, or at least the popular ones that show up in, yeah. in like a Google search. And there was 24. And I want to say this isn't, you know, check, correct me if I'm wrong, but I want to say probably 80 percent of those, maybe even more, are white female directors. Mm. And I feel like there's so much more room for the Chinese representation or like a Selma with the African-American representation. And there's more. I feel like Barbie was such a great success for women as a whole with the with the voice and the storyline. And I, it was obviously a sensation with Mattel tied to it. But I feel like there's just so much room and opportunity for more diverse voices. Yeah, there's so many different stories that need to be told, um, whether people haven't had the ability to do that or it's just like the, the system hasn't allowed for it right um it feels like you know I, I also looked at some of those lists and it feels like there are they're getting bigger they're getting more diverse if you look at the names that are appearing on those lists you have more people from the last few years if you yes. look at like 80s 90s 2000s not as many so i feel like we're moving in the right direction in the right direction as like a pop culture and culture in general yeah. i feel like but so. still a long way to go and going back to the interview with becky um she actually talked about some of the ways that we can start empowering other females and what was yes. one of those ways jesse uh, joining women in film and television i mean um networking and being in front of people and listening to other people's voices and championing them championing them um and really advocating for the people who are out there creating um you know i think that the more opportunity that we give other filmmakers the more that we're going to see other voices be represented on screen yeah and, and tell your own stories if you want to write if you think that there's something that's meaningful to you if there's a story in you that like needs to get out do it yeah on that note, <laughs> we are Loose Framing Podcast. Follow us anywhere you stream your podcasts or watch us on YouTube. And don't forget to follow us at Film Tampa Bay. Thanks, guys. <laughs>